June 54. At the frontier, a convoy of German trucks is cleared to drive across France for Reims and the French Grand Prix. Now, the population of France had become used to German lorries passing in the night. For had not the same thing happened 20 years ago, almost to the day? Then, the destination of the convoy had also been the French Grand Prix, but at Montlhéry. And, as at Reims, it was the first appearance of a German team after a war. The new cars amazed the 1934 crowds. What was to delight the crowds even more was that the German wonder cars were to be defeated by an Alfa Romeo driven by the Frenchman Louis Chiron. While they were still in the running, the German cars looked and sounded most impressive and would become unbeatable. In 1954, at Reims, the new German cars created a similar sensation, again impressing the knowledgeable French. The Fangio was the team's principal driver with Carl Kling. Special streamlined bodies had been built for fast circuits like Reims. From the fall of the flag, Fangio, world champion, leads the race with his teammate Kling close behind, watched by Hermann Lang, a pre-war Mercedes driver. The straight eight Mercedes engines sounded crisp and powerful, and the new cars handled well. The rest of the field, which included world-class drivers and Ferraris and Maseratis, were left cold. Well, they are back, though the applause was muted. Any Frenchman over the age of 10 at Reims that day had lived under German occupation. The memory remained green. But Fangio and Kling had given Mercedes a most convincing comeback. Ten years earlier, Daimler-Benz at Stuttgart was rubble. But the company soon made its contribution to the German economic miracle of the 50s. And production was soon booming to meet the insatiable demand for new cars at home and abroad. So much so, the technical director of the pre-war racing department, Rudolf Uhlenhout, was informed by the management that... It would be good to have some sort of competition car so that people realise Mercedes was still there. And he just said, we've got to do something. He didn't say what, he didn't say much, how much money we would get. So we took components from a normal passenger car which we were building. We took the engine, we took the gearbox, we took the front axle and the rear axle. So really it was quite a normal car. But we built a new frame and a new body. And this car was quite successful. The car was the famed Gullwing 300S, which was second in the Mille Emilia and had won an important sports car race in Mexico, which not unnaturally pleased the Mercedes manager. Yes, they were a bit too pleased, I believe, because then they took the decision to build a racing car. Once the decision had been taken, the whole resource of Daimler-Benz was at the disposal of the racing department. Ullenhout considered that a scaled-up version of the one and a half liter V8, which had defeated the Alphas at Tripoli in 1939, would be the best engine to build. The research department disagreed, arguing that a straight eight would be lighter. And if the drive were taken from the midpoint of the long crankshaft, the usual torsional vibration of a straight eight would be overcome. However, when the prototype first ran... The engine had terrific torsional vibration, so we had to put a torsional vibration damper on both ends, which eliminated the advantage of lighter weight. But it was uh, designed that way, we had to take it. If the straight eight was a little conservative, the decision taken to use fuel injection was, at the time, a radical departure for the car engine. During the Second World War, the Germans had taken a lead in the techniques of fuel injection, which was used in their aircraft. The system was direct. A timed and metered quantity of fuel had to be injected into each cylinder under high pressure. Unlike today's injection, in which the fuel, controlled by electronics, is sprayed at low pressure into the intake manifold. Their wartime system was entirely mechanical and relied on precision engineering of the highest order to meter the atomized fuel, from injectors able to withstand the very high temperatures and pressures inside each cylinder. 
The technique was difficult enough when applied to an aircraft engine of some 36 litres. When adapting it to a car engine, the total capacity of which was less than a single cylinder of the aircraft engine, it became an exercise of the utmost severity. But it was done. Test engines were soon running on the bench. From the pump, the high-pressure fuel pipes lead to each individual cylinder, injecting the correct quantity of fuel at the precise time, giving a 10% increase in power. The injectors look remarkably similar to the wartime version. Vital though the engine of a Grand Prix car undoubtedly is, the chassis does more than keep the wheels apart. The frame of the W196 was a superb design. Gas welded from thin steel tubing, it was light yet strong and rigid, essential for good handling. In general, the Germans tend only to trust techniques which they themselves have innovated or developed. Although British disc brakes had been successfully used by Connaught and Jaguar, for the W196, inboard drum brakes were used, which required drive shafts. There was an intriguing reason for this apparent complication. We thought we might eventually use four-wheel drive. And there it was better to have the brakes inside because you had to have the differential drive anyway. We first of all considered what wasn't perfect on our 39 racing cars. They had a Didion axle which had a tendency to judder on bad and bumpy roads. So we said that we've got to do something in that. Then we said, as our normal production cars had swing axles, we can't use a different axle. It's got to be some type of swing axle, else it wouldn't be good propaganda. But to cope with very much higher cornering speeds and stresses encountered in racing, a new version of the swing axle was produced for racing cars. Ullenhout demonstrates. It was to prove satisfactory and was later modified for production road cars. Behind closed doors in 1953, the first of the new cars were completed. When the W196 was revealed, it was clearly an advance on any possible rival. It was, of course, built to the highest standards, without regard to commercial considerations. It is true that the cars lacked the lines of Italian designs, but they possessed an air of efficient menace. The fuel and oil tanks were conventionally placed over the rear axle. The engine was canted to 70 degrees to lower the body line. Full fuel injection was used, and the valves were mechanically operated without the use of springs. The triangulated steel space frame was made from straight tubing. A five-speed gearbox transmitted 270 horsepower at 8,500 RPM. It had been said that the W196 was not a particularly advanced design for 1954. But the whole would prove greater than the sum of the parts. For 1954, two versions of the car would be raced, the open-wheeled and the streamlined car. Bodywork apart, the two cars were mechanically identical. The drivers preferred the open car. It could be more accurately placed on fast corners. At the British Grand Prix, Gonzalez leads. Even Fangio found the streamlined car difficult to place on the Silverstone corners, marked only by tubs, which he hit as the front of the car testifies. Fangio had set the fastest lap in practice, but had to settle for fourth place. It was to be Ferrari's day, Hawthorne being second. And teammate Gonzalez won the 1954 British Grand Prix. But any thoughts of an Italian renaissance were premature, as the experienced head of the Mercedes equipe, Alfred Neubauer, knew. Fangio would win no fewer than four Grand Prix in 1954 for Mercedes. Before signing for the German team, he had won in the Argentine and at Spa on a 250F Maserati to become world champion for the third time. 